The picture of the past flits by. The past can be seized only as an image which flashes up the very instant it is recognized and is never seen again. I'm Carl Giraffe, a 90-year-old uh, professor of chemistry emeritus at Stanford University and who still teaches uh, in the winter quarter at Stanford. I'm probably the oldest professor uh, doing this, uh, but an interdisciplinary seminar on science in theater rather than on chemistry. I'm an organic chemist. I was involved with oral contraceptives, with corticosteroids, with natural products, with physical methods, and I've published much so much in my life. I dreamt I'd gone to a bordello, a fancy one, red damask, plush sofas, a chandelier, deep carpet. Well, I changed my career, really my intellectual life, uh, at an unexpectedly late uh, stage. Namely, I was in my middle to late 60s, and I started research very early, so I'd been a chemist for nearly 50 years. And you know, I really decided it would be interesting to lead a totally different life. And uh, that of an intellectual smuggler, because uh, it was particular my work dealing with um, the pill and contraceptive, which made me realize that one has to communicate, if one talks about the social consequences of a scientific discovery, to, with a very broad public, in a very different manner from which scientists are accustomed to, which is lectures, scientific articles, and so on here. Uh, many of them are either not interested in what you have to say, or they're afraid of it, or they claim that they don't understand it, and they don't listen, even if you try to explain. So therefore, I thought I would smuggle it. I will hide it in what I initially called science in fiction, to differentiate completely from science fiction. In other words, everything I described in a pseudo uh, or quasi-fictional context is in fact either true or plausible. In other words, I don't violate the second law of thermodynamics, I don't have perpetual motion machines and things like this here, which could be very amusing, interesting in science fiction, but really don't work for my purposes, because my purposes admittedly are also somewhat didactic. Uh, after I did this for about 10 years, uh, I was by that time in my middle 70s. At that time, I was commuting between San Francisco and London. London, of course, is the theater town. Uh, I've been going to the theater for uh, decades, and I probably see something like 30 plays a year, so I've seen hundreds of plays. And I had no, no intention to write in for theater at that time, and I still remember exactly 1996 at the Cutterslow uh, National Theater, Royal National Theater, uh, seeing Stephen Polyakov's Blinded by the Sun, a play that people don't remember very much anymore. But that was one of the really pure chemical plays, and there were very few chemical plays, which dealt with the <clears throat> cold fusion debate. At that time, I didn't know that Polyakov, in fact, was the brother of the physical chemist uh, uh, Martin Polyakov, and that explained then also why he really, <clears throat> I think, rather well and presented the idiosyncratic behavior of scientists. Uh, I remember going out of it, uh, out of the play and telling my wife, I'm going to write a play now. And that play turned out to be an immaculate misconception, uh, which opened at the Edinburgh Fringe uh, in 1998 or 1999, uh, and was quite a success. And I got hooked. And I got hooked for the following reason, and that's a very important one. Namely, we scientists were not... Uh, able to write in dialogic form anymore. From the Greeks to the 17th century to Galileo and so on, people wrote a lot in dialogic form. I don't mean theater plays, but dialogue as a literary genre. That has pretty well disappeared. And the only remaining vestige of that is theater writing, which of course is dialogic writing to a very large extent. Uh, I'm a person who likes to indulge in dialogue, and I got tempted by it as a literary genre. And I got hooked on playwriting, and I've written 11 plays. And the first uh, few were all dealt with science, so that was an immaculate misconception. The second one, Oxygen, I wrote with a famous chemist, the uh, Nobel laureate, Old Hoffman from Cornell. And then the third one <clears throat> was called Calculus, and it's by my most British play, because it dealt with a really scandalous behavior <clears throat> between Newton, uh, Newton versus Leibniz, as to who invented the calculus. And I, quite frankly, posed a very brutal question. Uh, it's perhaps somewhat impolite to say it, but can a person be a shit as a person and a great scientist? 
And the answer with Newton is categorically yes. In fact, it is true with others as well, and that is a serious problem. And I think it's a problem that is worth debating and discussing. And I really <clears throat> consider one of my best plays, because I did an enormous amount of research on the famous conflict and where Newton, the most powerful scientist in, in Britain, also master of the mint, president of the Royal Society, uh, was obsessed by competition. And he appointed an anonymous committee of 11 fellows of the Royal Society who would then judge uh, who was first. And uh, what very few people knew, but it is also documented, he had then wrote the report and gave it to that committee. And I decided to write a play about it. And I write a play not so much about Newton, but in fact to show how dangerous uh, this sort of behavior is because we are examples to other people. And Newton, of course, was a dramatic example for other people. And if other people see that he could get away with this, then the tendency is that they might also do this. So that is really how it got, uh, got me hooked on playwriting and uh, fiction writing. You don't think you've had enough? Not nearly. So, you have the briefcase. Well, foreplay is a play that is based on the best book that I've ever written, Four Jews on Parnassus. Well, when people ask me, who are the four Jews that you're writing about? And I said, guess. And most people said, well, Einstein or Sigmund Freud or Karl Marx. Some people said Jesus and I said that too early. Uh, but it's none of them. And this case I wrote about four tremendous intellectuals that scientists probably don't know that well, although every university teaches them. They may write to Benjamin and Theodor Adorno, Gershom Scholem, who's less than known, and the Austin composer Arnold Schoenberg. And there's a reason for writing them, and I also write about Paul Clay. If you look at Walter Benjamin, uh, if you Google him, you get 2.4 million hits. Uh, if you Google his wife, you get a couple of hits. I was interested, for instance, and here comes my curiosity. They all had very well-educated wives. Adorno's wife was a PhD in chemistry, and yet People know practically nothing about them. They helped their husbands enormously, but they didn't get any credit for them. I decided to really go into the archives, and uh, what I found was, for instance, very interesting, is that there was one common denominator, and that was adultery, which is amazing, because there were completely different marriages, and there were completely different forms of adultery, just to give you an example. I picked up a number of other things, the question of jealousy, and then the border between erotica and pornography. And these were topics which interested me. Uh, I looked at them as a scientist, and yet they are human topics, they're not scientific topics here. And I decided to convert that book into a play. I write about foreplay, the double meaning of foreplay, that is, whether it's sexual or not, foreplay is always a precedent before we move to consummation. And the fact, the emphasis is always on consummation. And I wanted to point out that you can do the reverse, that in fact foreplay can be so much more diverse and so much longer lasting than consummation, which particularly sexually invariably is short and quick. Talk about foreplay itself as the ultimate objective, both intellectually and sexually. And that becomes the theme in this particular play. And I think it's both intellectually challenging and titillating at the same time. Of the 11 plays that I've written, it's the best play I've written, the most sophisticated play. And I could see how the audiences responded because I went to three or four performances. And I have to say, after the first one, <clears throat> I watched most of the audience rather than the play. I wanted to really see how they responded. And I really liked it. There were no drooping eyelids. There is a painting by Paul Clay called the Angulus Novus. It shows... I think we as scientists, particular chemists, in my opinion, are not very self-reflective. I never was this. We analyze the world around ourselves, uh, fantastical, uh, the best uh, analytical uh, chemists, and we measure everything, but at the molecular level. We don't really turn the mirror around and look in the mirror and see how we behave. But to describe how we behave, you be, need to be an insider. And you have to be an insider who is willing to wash dirty lab coats in public. And uh, it's my own lab coat, too, so I'm not a, you know, a muckraking journalist who talks about them chemists. I write about ourselves. Uh, I mean, we are disciplined, which is the, probably the most collegial of them all. At the same time, the most brutally competitive. And that combination is a very important one. And the other one is ambition. 
no question. We want to be first. We have an Olympic game, you might say, which is only gold medal. There are really no silver or bronzes. And, uh, you know, that type of ambition is both a nourishment for really the 70 or 80 hour work weeks that many scientists lead, but at the same time also the poison. And this balance between nourishment and poison, which is a very tricky one, which is a very important one, uh, which I have been trying to solve, probably unsuccessful in my own life, uh, but try to demonstrate and uh, really describe in, in my plays.